we picked that song this week because it goes with our message, Soldiers of Christ. So take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to encourage you this morning. If you came this morning and your life is great and you don't have a care of the world and, and just everything is going fine and Boy, you haven't had a better week in your life. I am so happy for you. I really am. I am overjoyed. I rejoice with you. But I meet so many of you, and I know personally, there's been some things in the last month that I say, God, do I have to go through this? Can we do this some other way? And you know what? There's hope in the Bible. That, there is. There's hope. God doesn't want us discouraged. He doesn't want us, oh, I can't believe this is happening. So I wanted to give you some help for the journey. Last week we talked about the importance of, of your work, what you do Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, what you do, most of your waking hours. That's important to God. And we talked about why that was. Today I want to remind you that we are soldiers of Christ and, and encourage you that regardless of your circumstances, uh, you're on the winning side. <laughs> Regardless of people who are standing in opposition to you, you're, if you're on God's side, you're on the winning side. Now notice I don't say if God's on your side. The Bible says if Christ be for us, who can be against us? God is pulling for you, but, but you do have to be on his side. There are people who are rejecting God, people who are in rebellion against God, and frankly, I have much pity for them. They're not on the winning side. But you can be on the winning side. And in Christ, you can be more than conquerors. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read to you verses 10 through 18. Follow along as I read out loud. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'm going to read that verse again and emphasize those same words. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. That's where I find encouragement right there. Because my strength is not enough for the journey. My hope, my courage, my emotional energy, it's not enough. But I can be strong in the Lord. And I can be strong in the power of his might. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereto, thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's pray, and then we'll look at the first half of this passage. Father, as I come to you one more time this morning, I am not ashamed. We spend so much time in prayer because it's on our knees it's when we're before you in the throne room that we find our strength that we find that wisdom that we need that we find grace for our trials we find mercy when we have sinned and and offended you and you tell us to come boldly to the throne of grace you tell us that we have access by faith you tell us that we have in Christ all the riches of your grace for all eternity. So we come boldly this morning to ask for help, to ask for that grace in our time of need, to ask for courage for those that are discouraged, to ask for wisdom for those that are wandering, to ask for a new direction for those that are purposeless or have the wrong purpose, that have been chasing the wrong dreams, they've been desperately trying to find happiness use the message this morning from your word use your Holy Spirit to redirect to give wisdom, to give strength to give courage and we'll praise you, we do praise you because you're a God who is for us not against us, 
Because you're a God who by faith gives us eternal life in that gift of your son. And we're so thankful for that. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I wasn't planning to address this this morning, so I ended up putting a little sticky on my notes because uh, when I came in this morning, a couple of you were talking about this. So I'm going to address it because it goes along with my message. I call it outrage culture. If you ever listen to the news or you listen to a podcast or you listen to your friend and you just get madder and madder about the way things are in this world, does it seem to you right now that evil is prospering and, and good seems to be attacked? Does it seem to you that those who hate God, those who are in rebellion against him, seem to be winning the battles and the people that are on God's side seem to be losing. And I'll tell you what, you can get angry about this, but let me ask you this question. When you get angry, when you get outraged, does that help you make the right decision? When you get angry and outraged and you just can't believe that this is happening, do you have the peace of God willing in your heart? When you turn on the news or you read the news or you listen to the news, however you consume the news, and you think, I can't believe that just happened. Does that fill you with joy? Do you have emotional energy to deal with your day when you start out outraged in the morning? I'm going to tell you my secret. I don't read the news. Amen. Not much of it. I read it out. I scan some headlines. I have a general idea of what's going on. I understand. Uh, no, I won't mention it. I, I, I know generally what's going on. But you know what? I don't have, God didn't call me to be outraged. And he didn't call me to outrage you. My goal in, in my message is every once in a while, maybe somebody gets upset, but my goal is not to, to, to just say, this is how bad it is out there, get angry. Because I know it's bad out there. Can I tell you a secret? It's always been bad out there. Man has always been wicked. Now, I, I praise the Lord that there have been times, I'm gonna take this off. There have been times in our culture when God has been honored and his word has been exalted. And boy, those of you who have lived through those times, praise the Lord for those times. But God called us to live here and now, Amen. not to hope for something in the past. We can only move forward in time. And I believe that we still have a God who's on the throne. He's still in control. He's not up in heaven wondering how he's going to fix things. He has a plan. He's told us what the plan is, plan is in his word. And rather than have you outraged and worried about what's going on out there, I want you to worry about your relationship with God Amen. and what's in your heart and what's in your life so that you can respond at work as a Christian. And I know that's becoming harder. It's not becoming harder for me. The people who work at this church are wonderful people. <laughs> but for you, I know it's getting harder. I know it's getting harder to deal with neighbors. It's getting harder to just deal with life. But as I mentioned earlier, in Christ, we are more than conquerors. I was reading as I was preparing for this message and, and just going through my week, I was reading about the events of September 11, 2001. We were preparing, my wife and I were preparing to move from the United States to Mongolia at the time. So we had already sold a lot of our goods. We packed a few other things and shipped them off to uh, Mongolia, that's another story, shipped them off to Mongolia, and we were living at my in-laws on, on the morning of September 11th. My uh, mother-in-law woke me up, uh, it was about six o'clock in the morning, and said, uh, I think you need to come see this. And uh, some of the pictures that we just saw, planes crashing into buildings, buildings collapsing, clouds of dust, <clears throat> Pentagon on fire. I, I, I said, okay, Lord, I'm supposed to leave next week, and they just grounded all the planes. You remember that. Domestic, international, nobody was flying. How are we ever going to get to Mongolia? That was my response on that morning. By the way, God got us to Mongolia. He always does. That's why I want you to focus on a God who's bigger than your problems. But you, some of you remember that, that morning. We're, this this is a key detail to understanding how the events of uh, September 11th unfolded. 
Here's the key detail. Always before, when people had hijacked a plane, they had some demand, right? They wanted money. They wanted to fly to Cuba. Heaven help them. I don't know why you want to do that. They wanted, they wanted some political prisoner released. And so on the morning of September 11th, it was 8.45. It was about 8 o'clock Eastern time when those first hijackers took over American Air Fly, Airlines Flight 11. Everyone thought they were going to make some demand of the airline. Okay, we want you to land the plane, we want money, we want people released, we want to fly to wherever. And so they had been taught, just cooperate. Just whatever the hijacker asks you to do, let them do that. At some point they're going to land the plane, we're going to make some deal or not deal or whatever, and we're going to get you off that plane if we can, don't worry about it. So they did that. Same thing with United Airlines Flight 175 and American Airlines Flight 77. And these buildings, as you know, were crashed into uh, the North Tower, the South Tower of the World Trade Center and into the Pentagon building. This happens to be the memorial in New York for the uh, World Trade Center. But something different happened on United Airlines Flight 93. On that flight, it had been delayed from taking off from New Newark, New Jersey. And then for some reason that's still not clear, we'll probably never know, the hijackers took extra long to hijack the plane. And then they told all the people that were on that plane, there was only 25, 30 people, passengers, some crew, then the hijackers, to get to the back of the plane. Some of those people on the back of the plane, they started to pick up those air phones. You remember when, when they had those phones in the back of the, of the seats in the airplanes? And they started calling loved ones. They started calling the uh, operator and saying, hey, we're on United Flight 93. We've been hijacked. They didn't know what was going on. At that time, there wasn't a, a Wi-Fi on planes. I had no idea what was going on. But they began to hear that the other three planes that have been hijacked, they hadn't made demands. They hadn't landed the planes. They crashed into buildings. And they said, uh, most likely, they're going to try to crash your plane into a building. Now, there were several people on that plane. I just want to focus on maybe the most famous passenger uh, because of his phone call. His name was Todd Beamer. Todd Beamer was a Wheaton graduate, Christian, knew the Lord, loved the Lord, happened to be on that cross-country flight. And he said, you know what? We're, we're going to make some plans to take this plane back. And he stayed on the line. There was some conversation. It wasn't clear what they could do. It was a single aisle plane. There were some, some uh, hijackers in the front of the plane protecting the, the, uh, the uh, cabin door. But what we do know is about tw a 20 minute flight from Washington, DC, United Airlines flight 93 crashed into an empty field. And the last two words that the operator heard Todd Beamer say was, let's roll. They decided it wasn't enough to just sit back quietly and, and wait to see what would happen to them. They decided they were going to do something about it. And you know, as Christians, we can sit back and we can be outraged. We can sit on the back of the plane and stomp our foot and yell and scream, but it's time to get up and do something. And I don't mean go down to the Capitol building in Sacramento and storm the building. What good would that do us? I mean in our personal lives, have a relationship with God that's daily and that's vital and that impacts the people around us. It changes our families. It changes our communities. It changes the places that we work. Rather than an outrage culture where we just get more and more angry, I want us to have a culture that emphasizes God's power and God's might in my personal life. Now, men, let me speak to you, because I think men struggle with this more than women. This has been my experience. By the way, I believe there's a difference between men and women. I'm going to get to that later. <laughs> you know, men, our problem is we don't really want God's might. We want to do it ourselves. We're the type of people, we don't even want to ask for directions. GPS has saved more marriages probably than any other technology in minute in the last 10 years. I remember driving around with my wife in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, and she'd say, honey, honey, listen, you need to turn left. I'm not turning left. I know where I'm going. 
We get lost, honey, honey, let's stop and ask. I don't need to ask for directions. <laughs> now we just put it in our phone. And if our phone gets us lost, then we get angry at the phone. <laughs> Probably GPS has saved a lot of marriages. But here's my point, men. We can't do it on our own. That's been our problem. We think we can be the husbands God's called us to be on our own, and we can't. We think we can be the fathers God's called us to be on our own, and we can't. We think we can be the workers. Surely I can get this job done on our own without God's help, and we can't. Neighbors, we can't. I, I put it right into my prayer list. To ask God for the strength and the wisdom that I need every day to be a good father and a good husband and a good neighbor and a good pastor and a good citizen of this country. We need men like that. That's the type of men we need. Let's roll. Now I want you to notice something. Hold your place in Ephesians 6 and just turn over a couple of pages. The next book is Philippians, uh, to, to your right. The next book after Philippians is Colossians. Find Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, teaches us something really, really important. That we need to understand if we're going to if we're going to be successful in this in this war that we are in. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. And we're coming into the middle of an argument that, uh, uh, of a comment that Paul is making. So he's talking about Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.14 says this. Blotting out Jesus, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Two words there, spoiled and triumph. Well, four words, because principalities and powers. Does those words principalities and powers bring anything to mind about the previous text we read? What are we warring against? <clears throat> principalities and powers. High, wickedness in, in high places, back to Ephesians chapter 6 and, and verse 12 against the powers of darkness. Notice, though, that these two words, spoiled and triumph. Triumph, we know, that means to win. Spoiled, we usually think of meat that's gone bad. We think of that dish in the back of the refrigerator that got pushed to the back and we forgot about it for a few months. It's never the husband that finds it. I can tell you that. I never come that. It's always my wife who's trying to keep things in good order, and she says, honey, what is this? And about the time she cracks the lid, we realize we shouldn't have cracked the lid. <laughs> that, that's what we think of when we think of spoil. That's not the, the meaning of this word. In, in a military context, to spoil the enemy means to take away what he has. Not only did Jesus defeat the principalities and powers, he's disarmed them. He's taken their weapons away. Now, go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Does that bring a different perspective to verse 10, where it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's already won. He's not only defeated his enemies, he's taken away their weapons. They have nothing to use against you if you are on God's side. But we are in a war. We are in a war. Verse 12 says it this way. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The problem with our war is that our, our main battle, these principalities and powers, these spiritual wickedness in high places, it's an unseen enemy. By the way, this is another complaint I have with outrage culture. When we get angry, we usually get angry at a person or a political party, or we get angry at the government, or we get angry at hospitals or doctors. We're getting angry at all the wrong things. The battle is not primarily against people. And that's why trying to, you know, capture a building is not going to change our nation. Our battle is against an unseen enemy but it's an unseen enemy that's already defeated. God's already taken their weapons away from them. 
But what is our enemy's goal? John 10, 10 says this, the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's our enemy's goal. Now, how is he going to do that if he is weaponless? If Jesus has already spoiled principalities and powers, if he's already taken away their weapons, he's triumphed over them, how is, how is our enemy going to hurt us? You know how he's going to hurt us? He's going to manipulate our minds so we're worried about the wrong thing. I played basketball growing up, and one of the fun things about basketball is when you've played with a couple of guys long enough that you know what each other are thinking. And I, I would learn, I had a, 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 it was actually my brother-in-law, my, my wife's brother, he, he was a really good player, and what he would do was he would look one way, and that was my cue to take off running behind my guy. He'd look one way and then pass the ball without even looking. Because he knew where I was going to be, and I knew where he wanted me to be. And I don't know how many times we fooled people that way. Misdirection. That's what our enemy does. Misdirection. You need to be mad at the governor. You need to be mad at the hospital. You need to be mad at your neighbor. You need to be mad at your coworker. That's not where the fight is. Now, I'm not saying you've, been, you've not been treated unjustly. Maybe you've been treated unjustly. I, I don't know. That's not. No. That's not what you need to be angry at. And we're so busy trying to get revenge. We're so busy trying to show people how wrong they are that we're missing where the real fight is. And the enemy's winning. Even though he's a defeated enemy. Even though he has no weapons. We're in a war. And we're called to stand. The temptation is we want to sit this fight out. Again, the enemy is defeated. He's disarmed. So the only way he can win is if he gets enough of us to just say, okay, that's okay. This, this isn't my fight. I'm just, I'm just going to sit here. Yeah. Whew, this is a lot more comfortable than standing in front of all of you. But what's God called us to do? To stand. And not to stand against our neighbor. Not to stand against our government. Not to stand against the hospital. But to stand against these principalities and powers are already defeated. We're going to talk about how we fight this battle a little bit today, a lot more next Sunday. But I want you to understand you are in a war and you're called to stand. But not only are you called to stand, four times he says stand. Verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then verse 14, stand therefore. God wants us to stand against these principalities and powers. And again, we'll talk more about how that works more next week. But God calls us to stand, but not to stand alone. Again, just look at the text with me. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye. Now I know, I've been told just recently again, this King James Bible is so hard to understand. I don't, I don't get it. Let, let me show you something. English word you, Y O W. The problem with the English word you, and I didn't realize this until I got to English word, Y O U. What did I spell it? I can't even spell. <laughs> Just ignore me. They wrote with the English word you, and I didn't understand this until I got to Mongolia, is it covers a lot of things. It can cover one person. I want you to go to the store, and I'm only talking to David, and it can cover a lot of things. I want you to sing with me, and I mean all of you. How do you know the difference? Well, in your King James Bible, if you see the word thou, T-H-O-W, it's speaking about one person. T-H-O-W. Oh. It's okay. W-U, it's all the same thing. I'm going to have to quit spelling. If you see T-H-O-U, that's one person. If you see Y-E, that's everybody. He's not saying, you stand, David. He's saying, you stand, Elmira Baptist Church. Amen. I'm not standing alone. You're not standing alone. We're going to stand together. Amen. Yes. And when you feel like, boy, I can't stand anymore, call me. Call him. Call a Christian brother. Call a Christian sister and say, hey, pray with me. I need to stand and I don't feel like it. 
we get this idea sometimes that we're Christian commandos, right? Yep. And we put all this black stuff on our face, and we put our black uh, clothes on, and we parachute behind enemy lines in the dark. I know I'm getting out of the camera. Those of you at home, I'll, I'm, I'm hiding, right? Christian commando. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out here all by myself with my little pea shooter, and I'm going to take on the enemy. That's not the picture here. We're an army. We're the army of God. We help each other. I've been told... I. I've been told that usually for every one soldier that's fighting in the field, there are 10 people su su providing support behind him. Guess what? It takes the whole army. It doesn't just take the one guy in the field. It takes all of us. We're standing together. We're in a war. But listen, we're in this together. Don't be a Christian commando. Be a Christian soldier. Be a part of the army. Be a part that's why being a part of a church is so vital. You say, well, you just want me to be a part of you. I don't care what church you're a part of, as long as you're a part of a church that's standing together against the wild. Amen. But if you're not part of any church, guess what? You're a Christian commando. And maybe you shoot one or two of the enemy, but guess what? They're going to overrun your position real quick. We must stand together. That's what it says. Ye... Wherefore, take unto you, I'm in verse 13, that you, Y-O-U, I got it, Y-O-U, that you is also plural. It's not you singular, take you, the armor of God, it's you, all of you. We're going to stand together. I read a verse to the men yesterday, I'm going to read it to you, to Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Malachi 3, 16 says, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. Do you get the, do you get the picture there? People who feared the Lord, they started talking to each other. And guess who was listening? God was listening. When, when you grab your fellow Christian, you grab a Christian sister, you grab a Christian brother, and, and you say, hey, let's talk about the Lord. Let's encourage each other in the Lord. Let's make sure we're doing what's right. Guess who's listening? God's listening. He's pleased. Because look what it says. Oh, well, you're not there. Malachi 3.16. And a book of remembrance was written before him, before God, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Boy, that, that verse really encouraged me this week. I, I, I think trouble is coming, by the way. I mean, it doesn't take a a lot of intelligence to realize trouble is coming. But rather than get angry about it, guess what I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about God. Amen. We're going to exalt our God. We're going to make him big. We're going to lift him up. We're going to talk about how great he is. We're going to talk about what a great protector he is. We're going to talk about what a great provider he is. And God's going to hear that, and he's going to take down names. And he says, those, those people, they're mine. We're going to be on God's team. There's hope. I don't care how bad this world gets, there's hope if you're on God's team. Finally, as we think about this idea of fighting, I want you to, uh, and standing, excuse me, I want you to notice that it's called the armor, the whole armor of God. It's not your armor. It's not the armor you cobble together. I, I can't even fix the plumbing in my house. How am I going to make armor? I don't. I take it from God as a gift. Amen. It's his armor. Verse 10 again. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. This is good news. Because the reason this is good news is it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. You can be a Christian one day and be just as mighty and ready to stand as someone who's been a Christian for 40 years. Because it's not your power. It's not your wisdom. It's not what you're able to do. It's God's armor. It's God's power. It's God's mind. All you have to do is put it on. You say, Pastor, you know, I'm just a young Christian. I don't know what to do. Listen, you come to tonight, 5 o'clock. Come Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday morning, 9.45. Next Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. By the end of those four lessons, I tell you, you'll know something else to do. Amen. Yeah. And you're going to stand in God's might and in God's power, and, and you'll get there. Amen. 
But it's not me. It's not my power. It's a gift. I'm always encouraged. Ephesians, uh, let's just turn back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Think about God, what God's done for us. Again, God is so much bigger than our problems. Think about what God has done for us. Ephesians 2, verse 6 says this. This is God. God hath raised us up together. Again, there's a group of us. Raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Not just the riches of his grace, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. Wow, that's a big God. He's got a lot of grace. He's more, got more grace than I will ever need. And no matter how much grace I take out of the exceeding riches of his grace, there's always enough for you to. Amen. He gives it as a gift. Grace is always a gift. Grace isn't something I demand. God, this is what I've earned. This is what I deserve. Grace is something God gives me because I say, God, I, I can't. I can't. I need your help. But understand this. This is really important to understand. The Christian life is power. The Christian life is power. But it's not the power to recreate reality to fit what you want. Too many Christians, what they want God's power to do is make life the way they want life to be. And I'm there. <laughs> How many times have I come to God and said, God, if you only do this, it would make my life easier. You know what? God isn't interested in making my life easier. He's interested in conforming me to the image of Jesus Christ. And I, I'm just going to be frank with you. I'm just going to lay it out there. It hurts. You ever played with Play-Doh? As a kid, I loved Play-Doh. I take those plastic molds, and you stick the Play-Doh in it, and you squeeze the mold together, and a bunch of Play-Doh gets shot out all the sides, lands on the floor, upsets the teacher. You can't get Play-Doh on the floor. And then you pull open that mold, and there's the image that you're looking for. But it took pressure, and it took getting rid of extra Play-Doh. And you know, that's what God does in my life. He says, oh, you've got a little bit too much of that, and you're a little bit too comfortable. I'm going to put you under pressure. I'm going to get rid of this piece you don't need anyway, and I'm going to conform you to the image of Jesus Amen. Christ. And we say, no, 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 no. God, I don't want that. I want you to fix this for me. Listen, it's not about your plan. It's I know it'd be much easier if I could just say, come to God and he'll do what you want. No, God doesn't do what you want. God invites us to do what he wants. Amen. We get to be a part of that. And I'm excited to be a part of that. Amen. And I'd much rather have what God wants for my life than what I want for my life. Amen. Ephesians 2, verse 10, we just looked at verses 6 and 7. Notice what Ephesians 2, 10 says. For we are his workmanship. Whew. We're God's creation. God gets to decide what we look like and where we're born and who we're born to and who our parents are and who our children are, what country we're in and what our government looks like. God gets to decide all that because his work is to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. So understand this, the Christian life is power. But it's not power to recreate reality to fit my plan. The Christian life is power to order my life to fit God's creative plan. Christian life is power to order my life to fit God's creative plan. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's the power. So I'm telling you, there is power with God. There is no power shortage with God. We can stand in the power of his might, in his strength, but we're not going to get necessarily what we want. And this is where many Christians become discouraged. Because they go to God, and they beg him, and beg him, and beg him to make their life easier. And he doesn't make their life easier, and they say, okay, then I'm not interested. I'm sorry. That's not how Christian power works. It's not how the armor of God works. We've watched too many superhero movies where the guy puts on the cape, right? And all of a sudden, he can do whatever he wants. 
And we want to just put on the cape and then do whatever we want. And that's not how it works. The Christian life is power to order my life to fit within God's creative plan. Well, I'm glad I didn't try to bite off all six pieces of armor today. But I do want to get to two. The first piece of armor is the truth. The belt of truth. Notice it starts when God lists his armor. It starts with truth. By the way, the whole armor of God, that word whole armor, translates a Greek word, panoplia. And we sang in our song today about soldiers of Christ's rise, the whole panoply of God. We've, we've literally robbed that word from the Greek, and we've said, okay, a panoply. A panoply is all the armor God has, the whole armor. God wants us to put all six pieces on, truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, and the Bible. But we're only going to get to two today. So if you want the other two, guess what you have to do? Come back next week. Amen. You say, why do you do that? Because I don't trust you. <laughs> I don't. If I give you the whole thing today, you're not going to come back next week. Right, Marcus? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm talking to you. Are you going to come back next week and hear the other half? He's thinking. Okay. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm, I'm, can I just be honest with you guys? Right? I don't trust you. <laughs> two things. Truth. The belt of truth. <clears throat> Do you realize how many lies there are in our culture? We, we could be here. This could have been the sermon. I, 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 I didn't want to, I didn't trust you to be here six weeks either, so I had to work it down to two. There's the lie of evolution, denying that God created any, everything. There's the lie about life, about the, the value of human life. By the way, if you believe in evolution, what gives life value? If I'm just an evolved pond slime, then why is my life more valuable than yours? Or you're like, why is any of our lives valuable? There's the lie of humanism. This idea that man can understand and control everything. Now, this is, I know I'm opening up Pandora's box, but this is so well illustrated in our current pandemic. Yes. Don't you feel like from the beginning, we were told scientists understood what was going on and they were going to control it? Scientists are nice guys, but they're human beings, and they make mistakes. And I'll just remind you, first we were told no mask was okay, and then we were told a mask was okay, then we were told two masks, and then we were told the vaccination and then you don't need a mask, then we were told the vaccination plus a mask, now we're told two, you'll need a booster shot. Listen, if it's not clear to you, they don't know for sure. They don't. Now, I'm, by the way, that's not a criticism. You say, well, do you know? I don't know, but I'm not telling you how to live your life either about the pandemic. I'm just pointing out they don't know for sure. They told us if enough of us got vaccinated, I believe it was 70%. We were told if 70% of us got vaccinated, the virus would go away. Now, you say, well, America hasn't reached 70%. We don't know. Israel's reached 70%. The virus didn't go away. Now, again, I, I, please don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to be critical of people. I'm just pointing out. We're human. We don't know everything. Amen. We can't control everything. Climate change? You think, you think that if we all drive electric vehicles, that the forest will stop burning down? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. If you want to drive an electric vehicle, go ahead. Matt, you drive a hybrid. It's half. Okay? It's not that I'm against electric vehicles. Mankind cannot understand and control everything. We can't. If you believe that we can, your God is humanism. Your God is humanism. We don't worship humanism. We worship a God. God is in control. He does know everything, and he does control everything. Now you say, well, I don't like the way he's controlling me. Join the party. But I believe he does control everything. And I believe that when I need wisdom for my next step, God says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and uprighteth not, and it shall be given him. That's the truth. The lie is humanism. They lie to us about male and female. They lie to us about Jesus Christ being the only way of salvation. I've met countless people who say, I'm so glad Jesus Christ works for you, but my truth is different. No, no. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the way. The truth. No, no man cometh to the Father. <clears throat> We're going to get back to that in a minute. So to wear the belt of truth means that we recognize 
that God is truth, Jesus is the truth, and that he gives us all the truth we need right here. Now, that doesn't mean I turn my mind off. I tell you what, to read this Bible and understand its application in my life takes a lot of thinking. But it's going to start right here. It's not going to start with what the scientists say, even though they're nice people. It's not going to start with what the government says. I'm not against the government. I'm just saying it's not going to start there. It's going to start with what God says. Amen. It's not going to start with what my biology teacher tells me about evolution. It's going to start with what God says. It's not going to start with what my neighbor says he knows to be true because he's talked to the aliens when they abducted him. It's going to start with what God says. That's what, to wear the belt of truth, that's what it means. You're going to start right here. Now, I, I know some of you don't understand. You're like, you mean this book that's thousands of years old. You're going to base your life on it? You, yeah. yeah. Guess what? Every person in this room is basing your life on something. That's right. Something. And maybe it's your own intelligence. This is where I'm going to base my life. That's what to wear the belt of truth means. Uh, so many more things we can say about that. Basing our lives on the truth of God. To wear the belt of truth means that we must live our lives according to God's created order. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in. And that's what, that's what to wear the belt of truth means. Now, let me get to the next part, which is the breastplate of righteousness. Philippians 3.9, just a book over, but I'm just going to read it to you. Philippians 3.9 says, And be found in him, that's in Jesus, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I quoted that verse to begin because I want you to understand the breastplate of righteousness is not your righteousness. If, if I had to wear my righteousness as a breastplate, it would look more like a thin cotton t-shirt. And guess what? Nobody wants to go into a battle with swords wearing a thin cotton t-shirt. That would be my righteousness. In fact, it would have holes in it. The thin cotton t-shirt would have holes in it. But boy, you put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's armor that can't be penetrated by the enemy. It's not my righteousness, it's your righteousness. Notice it says the righteousness which is through the faith of Christ. In, in the previous verse I, I read in um, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, notice it says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you the question, and this is rhetorical. Whose breastplate of righteousness are you wearing? Now I know some of you are like me. Simple things help you understand. I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be in Jesus Christ. And I want to use an ordinary cup, biodegradable, and some animal crackers. They claim these are edible. <laughs> I hope they are, because it'll go far in my illustration. This is what it means to be in Christ. You know, when, when God looks at Scott Dean, he sees an ugly, sinful, careless, callous human being. He, I, I'm nothing. In fact, I'm, I'm worse than nothing. I'm an active rebel against the God of heaven on my own. But put me in Christ Jesus and now when he looks at me he doesn't see me at all guess who he sees Christ. Jesus Amen. Christ Amen. that's the righteousness that is by faith you know what our enemy wants to do he wants to kill and to destroy he literally wants to those are not good get those crackers too <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you try one after the service they're stale I knew that when I opened it but here's my point the Bible says be sober be vigilant for your adversary as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour I'm not eating the second one but he's trying to eat you <laughs> that's what he's doing you place me in Jesus Christ and I have all the righteousness of Jesus Christ this armor of righteous this breastplate of righteousness is not me being a good person you say well I really like you I think you're a nice person 
That's fine, but before a holy God, I am not a nice person. The breastplate of righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You say, well, you know, Pastor, that's really nice, but I'm a bad person. It doesn't matter. You can be a murderer. God can save you. Amen. You can be a thief. God, God can save you. You can be selfish, self-centered, and conceited, and God can save you. You can be a wreck. God can save you. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ is my point. It's not me. You say, well, I don't even have a tie. What does a tie have to do with it? Well, put a, put a tie on over a t-shirt with holes and go out to battle? That's dumb. The enemy's just going to grab your tie and strangle you. I want the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what I want. That's what you want. We want that righteousness that is by faith. The faith in Jesus Christ. I, wanted to, I want you to take this verse with you this week. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Look at it with me again. Ephesians 6 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Memorize that verse. Write it down on a card. Read it over and over. Amen. Meditate on it. Because this week you're going to go out Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. You're going to go out in your days to work, and you're going to go out in your days off, and you're going to go in the power that is in Christ Jesus. But before I get to the invitation, I just want to ask you, who's armor, whose breastplate of righteousness do you have on? Your own or Jesus? Because I've met a lot of people that are going through life, they're trying to get to heaven, they're trying to please God, they're trying to, to get to eternal life by their own goodness. They're, they're, you know, they give money to the church and they come to the church service and they're, I don't know how many men I've talked to, they say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a good father. I'm happy they're a good father. But that doesn't get people to heaven. That doesn't give us eternal life. Well, I, I pay my taxes. I hope you do. The Bible tells us to pay our taxes, but that doesn't get people to eternal life. And if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I just came today because I don't know what else to do. And frankly, I'm a wreck. I have nothing to offer to God. That's exactly where God wants us. Amen. I have nothing to offer to God. I just come with my t-shirt full of holes and I say, I'd like the breastplate of righteousness, please. Amen. And it's the whole armor of God, not mine. Whose armor do you have on? And then second, Christian, are you putting on the armor of God every day? You know what we do? We put it on on Sundays because we know we've got to put on, we've got to look good for church. I, I'm not as, I'll be frank, I'm not as concerned about what you look like Sunday as I am Monday through Saturday. Amen. Now, I do want you to look nice when you come to church. Not, I'm not talking about what you wear. I'm saying, come with a smile. Come excited to be here. That's what I'm saying. But it's more important to me how you go to work Monday through Saturday. It's more important to me what you do on your day off. Are you putting on the armor of God? We're about to sing number 306, Pass Me Not. The fourth verse. Let's make sure we get the fourth verse in, Scotty. He says, Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Christian, we've got to get a renewed vision for who God is. Quit looking at our own problems, our own circumstances, our own family, our own, this isn't working and that isn't right. And every time I get to the end of my day, and we need to look at a God who is so much bigger than our problems and say, I'll take that arm and I'll put it on today. Father, have mercy upon us. I am not a good person. You know that. You know that outside of Jesus Christ, I'm an ugly, selfish, conceited sinner. And I thank you that in Christ Jesus, I have access to all the riches of your grace, eternal life. The grace I need day by day, this panoply, this armor, this whole armor of God, the opportunity to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ and to, and to wear the belt of your truth around my waste and to take up your word as my sword and, and faith in you is my shield father thank you for this 
armor of God that you give to us freely by faith. I pray first of all, for anyone here who's not a Christian, they don't know that their sins are forgiven and that they're on their way to heaven. And, and I ask for them that this morning, this afternoon, would be the day of salvation for them. And, and number two, for my Christian sisters, my Christian brothers, that we quit trying to do it on our own. I pray that we quit thinking we can do this. We don't need to stop and ask for directions. And we would put on the armor of God and go in your strength and in your might this week. We need that. Help us, we pray. Before I close this prayer, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to give a chance to you to respond. Is there anyone this morning that would say, Pastor, I don't know that my sins are forgiven and that I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me? Would you lift your hand? I, I would. I'd like to pray for you. If you'll lift your hand, I'd be glad to pray for you. Father, you see our hearts. We come to you humbly. We need you. Every hour, we need you. Give us that fresh vision of who you are. Give us that fresh vision of your power and your unlimited, exceeding riches of your grace. And we, may we allow you to conform us to the image of your Son. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.